close your eyes. I want you to picture the knowledge that's in your head right now. Can you feel it? One way I can probe your knowledge is by asking you questions. That is, things you can know without leaving your chair, without interacting with the world in any way. None of your senses are allowed. Do you think this collection of knowledge can grow just by sitting there pondering to yourself? Now you can open your eyes. The process of going from question to a definite answer is at the root of logic. Logic explores arguments for truth. When we walk this pathway from question to answer, we call it reasoning. And logic is the study of sequences of reasoning. A big reason why Aristotle's ideas on logic matter today is because he steered the subject in what we would now call the modern direction. He wanted to define perfect arguments for truth. So he looked for general patterns, that is, things that make something true no matter what subject you are thinking of. This is called abstract thought, but what exactly is abstraction? Close your eyes one more time. Imagine a tree you've never seen. Now you have some abstract concept of tree in your head, which was just activated. It's abstract because it's not a memory of a tree you've seen in the past. It's a more general concept or feeling of what you associate with treeness. With it, you can generate new trees in your mind you've never seen before. Now open your eyes. Your idea of tree is general enough to fit with any specific tree I show you. You can carry all trees in your head. That's abstraction. Now go. This window will help. Children begin abstracting when they come to understand shapes and numbers as categories. Can you make two towers? Can make two. One, two. Three, go. And words or symbols act as the bridge between physical things and abstract concepts. For example, as a child you memorize the word tree perhaps using a specific example, but tree became a label for your tree category. For Aristotle, it was important to separate these abstract categories from specific physical things in our world. He called this physical matter the primary substance and the abstract categories in our mind as the secondary substance. You also have another word, human, which defines this abstract category which all people have existed and will exist belong to. What's important to see here is that the human category and the tree category don't contain any shared stuff. There are no human trees. But abstract categories can contain each other. For example, mortality contains both trees and humans. So these are the categories which Aristotle describes as secondary substances. And often when we are making statements about the world, we are actually just expressing connections between categories. And Aristotle shows this with a very simple example known as a proposition of the form, all something are something, such as all humans are mortal. Remember, when we make this claim, we are saying that all things we could point to in the physical world will follow this pattern. While the opposite isn't necessarily true. So these statements are like building blocks for Aristotle. His whole system is built on a very simple rule about them. Valid statements must be true or false, but never both true and false at the same time, known as the law of non-contradiction. Next, he shows how we can then combine these statements to build new truths. And his idea is based on how we argue that something is true or not. If we try to make a logical argument, it means we are arranging a sequence of statements people already agree on as true and build to the statement in question. He thought of this as a perfect argument, since there is never a step where things break down. 
known as deduction. A common example, how can we prove that the statement, all Greeks are mortal, is true? To answer this deductively, Aristotle uses a conditional statement as the framework, which leads to the following form. If all, statement one, and all, statement two, then all, statement three. And he puts the statement we want to prove as true at the bottom of this sequence. The process of deduction is to fill in statement one and two using knowledge which is already agreed on as true. So one thing we already know is all humans are mortal. Now we just need another statement which helps us connect Greekness to mortalness, such as all Greeks are human. If all Greeks are human and all humans are mortal, then all Greeks are mortal. The first two statements are known as the premise of our argument, and the third is the logical conclusion. If we can agree that the premises are true, then the conclusion must follow. This is known as a syllogism. But Aristotle only used specific examples to get people to his core idea. His big leap was to see that we only need to look at the structure of the words, not the content of the words. Remember, your way of representing the category Greek could be this combination of letters in English, or maybe you represent it as the color blue in some sort of color language. So now let's put together the same argument using this color system. Notice the colors bring out the pattern to his system more clearly. We connect blue-green concepts using a shared yellow concept, known as the middle term. So the final step Aristotle took was to remove the content of this argument from the form, that is, forget what the colors even represent. Think of them as variables. So any words or categories you choose to replace the colors blue, yellow, and green will still result in a valid argument leading to some true statement. Try it. Syllogisms, while simple, are important because they act as building blocks for even more complex arguments, allowing us to chain together statements which connect and quantify any abstract ideas we want. Logic allows us to reason about the world abstractly without any physical basis. We can just sit in our chairs and expend energy on abstractions. But what is the limit of logic? That is, are there some true statements which are out of reach of logic? <laughs>